Ever since the Battle of Trafalgar, the British Navy had dominated the seas. Pre-war displays like the Spithead Review showed its might. I remember going to a review at Spithead where the Spithead was full of ships of all sizes and it was a, a delight to be there because as children we were all very excited about it. Everywhere you went you would see blue jackets, you would see sailors everywhere. So we were a naval um, uh, country in those days. Britain, a small island, depended on trade and keeping its trade routes open and safe required control of the sea. But in the decade leading up to World War I, British naval supremacy had faced a new challenge. Ever since he'd become Emperor of Germany in 1888, Kaiser Wilhelm II had been determined to build an overseas empire to rival other European nations. To acquire this empire, he needed to build a navy. The Kaiser's ambitions and Britain's determination to maintain its lead at sea led to a hugely expensive naval arms race. At its heart was a new type of battleship, pioneered by the British and named after the first to be built in 1905, the Dreadnought. It was enormous and outgunned anything built before. The Dreadnought introduced two fundamental changes in battleship technology. First, it replaced the main armament of four heavy guns with an armament of eight or ten heavy guns. And secondly, gradually introduced high-powered turbine engines, so it increased the speed of the fleet. Essentially, it's a quantum leap in the performance of the battleship. And for a period of eight years, you have a sustained building race in which ever bigger and more powerful battleships are built in competition. Admiral Lord Fisher, inventor of the Dreadnought, claimed it made every other class of battleship irrelevant. The only issue is the number of Dreadnoughts. No matter who tries to fight the Dreadnought, the Dreadnought gobbles them all up. It's the armadillo and the ants. The armadillo puts out its tongue and licks up the ants. By the time war was declared in August 1914, Germany had built 13 dreadnoughts to Britain's 21. Ordinary sailors on both sides now looked forward to putting their massive new weapons to the test. There's great enthusiasm and recruits are flocking in daily. If only the German fleet would come out, we would wipe them out in a few minutes. Fred Bundy was a 15-year-old cadet when war broke out. Oh, I just knew that the Kaiser was somebody I didn't know what to know. And if I had a chance, I'd shoot him if I had a chance, you know. As soon as he could, Fred Bundy joined up full-time. I thought it was wonderful. In a trench, for instance, that I'd just have to run up top and get bullets in me, anything like that, or join in the Navy. And, well, ships had always been my ideal. German sailors were just as excited. In 1914, seaman Richard Stumpf was waiting with the German high seas fleet. Our joy and excitement were boundless and lasted late into the night. The thing we had yearned for and feared had come true. We had built our navy so we could fight the false and treacherous English. But the sheer expense and prestige of the dreadnoughts began to have a curious result. No one could afford to lose one. Admiral John Jellicoe, commander of the Grand Fleet based at Scarpa Flow, was reluctant even to let his dreadnoughts out of port. Provided there is a chance of destroying some of the enemy's heavy ships, it is right and proper to run risks of our own. But unless the chances are reasonably great, I do not think that such risks should be run. His main fear was that if he took his very expensive battle fleet to sea and he lost a battle, uh, he effectively might, as he put it, lose the war in an afternoon. So you would get two fleets in their fleet anchorages or at their headquarters and bases, which were mutually opposing each other. And 
in a sense, stalemated each other by not even going to sea. The caution was so great that it would be a full two years into the war before the fleets of both sides engaged in a proper battle. As the dreadnoughts stayed safely in their harbors, the rest of Britain's navy set out to starve Germany by blockading it and stopping its trade with the outside world. The British, with their vastly bigger surface fleet of cruisers and destroyers, quickly gained control of the North Sea. They were able to intercept almost all merchant shipping from neutral nations headed for German ports. The neutral ship would go into a British port and their cargo would simply be bought by the British for their own use. So the neutrals weren't particularly disappointed. Their voyage was cut short, they got home sooner, and they were paid in full. So essentially nobody was upset apart from the Germans. German sailors could only watch as naval superiority enabled Britain to stock up for war while their own nation was made to suffer. When one saw the amount of shipping converging on Britain, when one saw how busily the enemy was engaged in importing from all quarters of the globe the materials that reinforced his strength in his fight against us, one saw the writing on the wall. 